Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Um, my name is um, Dr. Mascaram Gabregzaber, and I am a clinical professor <clears throat> and director of inclusion and community engagement in the School of Human Evolution and Social Change um, here at Arizona State University. Uh, I feel incredibly privileged to, to be able to provide timely and important programming, such as today's lecture, and uh, want to thank all of you for joining us. <clears throat> Welcome to the second lecture of the semester in our ongoing colloquium series titled Toward a Liberatory Theory and Praxis. This monthly series aims to highlight the work of contemporary scholars um, belonging to identities and traditions marginalized within mainstream Western academia who through their work confront neo-colonial neo power structures and challenge longstanding norms of knowledge production. Um, it was born out of a demand from our graduate students for exposure to a more critical scholarship that is relevant to their lived experiences and the times in which we are living. Um, specifically, I would like to thank Nalubega Ross, Tisa Lowen, Aliyah Hoff, and Dr. Anais Roque, who worked with me to conceptualize this series and establish its parameters. I want to thank the Shesk staff for all they do to make these events a success, particularly our communications director, Brian Schramm. I also um, want to acknowledge Shesk leadership for all uh, for supporting and sponsoring this series, specifically our unit director, Dr. Chris Stojanowski. <clears throat> um, there, this will be the final talk for the fall, but we will be back in the spring with four more exciting talks. So um, keep an eye out for information on those. Um, as you all can probably tell, my voice is going um, <clears throat> in and out today. So Brittany Romanello, uh, one of our brilliant PhD candidates has graciously agreed to help me facilitate um, sort of the introduction and facilitate the Q&A later on today. So uh, my sincerest, sincerest gratitude goes out to her as well. And I would like to sort of um, go on now and go ahead now and pass um, the mic on to her. Thank you so much. So before I introduce our wonderful speaker today, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. Please note that this presentation and the Q&A to follow is being recorded. You, the audience, will not be visible in the recording and all of the mics will be off. As Meski mentioned, we'll be leaving time for questions after the talk, and we're asking that you write your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you would like to vocalize the question yourself rather than have Meski or I read it out loud, please write ask live in parentheses at the end of the question you'll be submitting with the Q&A button, and we will call on you and unmute you so your mic um, will allow you to do so. So without any further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Gina Velasco. Dr. Velasco is an assistant professor in the Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies program at Gettysburg College. She holds a PhD in the history of consciousness and feminist studies from the University of California at Santa Cruz. Dr. Velasco is an Andrew W. Mellon postdoctoral fellow and the gender and sexuality studies program at Bryn Mawr College and has been a visiting scholar at the Beatrice Bain Research Group at the University of California at Berkeley and the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality at New York University. Her research and teaching examine how gender and queer sexuality inform notions of nation, diaspora, and national belonging in a contemporary context of globalization. Her writing and teaching encompass a range of fields, including queer studies, feminist theory, transnational feminisms, women of color feminisms, diaspora studies, ethnic studies, and Asian American, Filipina, Filipino American studies. Her book called Queering the Global Filipino Body, Contested Nationalisms in the Filipino Filipino Diaspora was published in the Asian American Experience Series of the University of Illinois Press in 2020 and will provide the basis of her talk today. Her writing has been published in the journals of uh, Amerasia, uh, journal Women in Performance, a journal of feminist theory, the International Feminist Journal of Politics, the Review of Women's Studies, and the edited collection called Asian American Feminisms and Women of Color Politics. In addition to her excellent scholarship, Dr. Velasco also has a strong record of advocacy. She's a member of the Critical Filipina and Filipino Studies Collective, a group of scholar activists within Filipina, Filipino, Fil Filipinex, and Philippine Studies. 
Prior to entering academia, she was the national coordinator of the Student Peace Action Network, called SPAN, where she led a national campaign for demilitarization, focusing on US domestic militarization of police and the prison industrial complex, as well as a campaign to end US sanctions against Iraq. As a student at the University of Texas at Austin, she worked with other student activists to establish the Center for Asian Amer American Studies and co-founded the first Women's Resource Center at the university. Everyone, please join me in welcoming this brilliant scholar and activist, Dr. Gina Velasco. All right, just one second while I get my slides together. Sorry, just one second, technical difficulties. Can everyone see the slides okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, thanks for your patience. Um, thank you especially to Musky for the invitation to speak here today. Thank you to the school of human evolution and social change at ASU for sponsoring this event. In this talk, I'm gonna give an overview of the theoretical framework of my book, Queering the Global Filipina Body, Contested Nationalisms in the Filipina Filipino Diaspora. So just a quick note on the term I'll be using, Philippinex. So since I submitted the final manuscript of this book in 2019, the debate on the term Philippinex has evolved and it is somewhat similar to the debate around Latinx. So although I use Filipina, Filipino in my book, I'm going to use, I'm going to shift between those terms and Filipinex contextually in this talk to reflect the growing use of Filipinex as a more gender inclusive term. The second season of the TLC cable TV show, 90 Day Fiance, introduced viewers to Daya, a pediatric nurse and a prospective bride from the Philippines who travels to the US for the first time on a K-1 visa, a fiance visa, to visit Brett, a white American man who lives in Washington state. A U.S.-based reality show, 90 Day Fiancé, offers a glimpse into the lives of binational couples who meet online. The audience shares in the tears and frustration experienced by Daya as she faces rejection from Brett's overprotective mother, who fears that Daya is only interested in Brett for his U.S. citizenship. Against all obstacles, Daya and Brett proceed to fall in love and get married during the course of her three month stay in Washington. This drama plays out the familiar tropes of the global Filipina body with which US consumers of pop culture are already familiar. The figure of Daya, who is both a nurse and a prospective male order bride, embodies two tropes of Filipinx transnationalism. The hardworking Filipina nurse who migrates to work abroad, and the Filipina mail order bride who seeks an American man to marry for purposes of immigration. The nurse and the mail order bride are examples of the global Filipina body, a term I use to describe the gendered figures of Filipinx transnationalism 
that embody the forms of domestic, sexual, and affective labor that Philippinex workers provide for a global economy. Responding to global capital's need for devalued flexible labor, the Philippine state has played a significant role in brokering a contemporary global, global labor diaspora of more than 8 million Philippinex migrant workers. Although not all women, Philippinex workers perform gendered labor working as nurses, maids, nannies, elder care providers, housewives, and sex workers. Despite the diversity of the kinds of gendered transnational labor that Filipinas provide, from the domestic labor of maids to the sexual labor of sex work, these distinct forms of labor are often collapsed in the generalized figure of the global Filipina body within both pop culture and Filipinex American cultural production. Sorry, another difficulty with my slides, just one minute. As a figure for the feminized position of the Philippines within a gendered international division of labor, the global Filipina body serves as a geo body for the Philippine nation status under contemporary neoliberal globalization. Philippine film studies scholars, Roland Tolan, Philippine film studies scholar Roland Tolentino introduced the term geo body to describe how transnational figures such as the Filipina mailer bride stand in for the Philippine nation itself. Daya, the Filipina mailer bride on 90 Day Fiance, is a geo body for the Philippine nation. She corporealizes devalued and feminized Filipinex transnational labor. Within both global popular culture and Filipinex diasporic culture, the global Filipina body is a ubiquitous figure that signifies the subjection of Filipinex bodies to the gendered and racialized effects of neoliberal globalization. As such, the global Filipina body indexes broader debates about gender, gendered migrant labor and embodiment in the context of globalization, whether represented as a male or bride, a trafficked woman or an overseas contract worker, the global Filipina body makes evident the ways in which global capitalism naturalizes exploited, racialized, and gendered labor. Each chapter of the book focuses on an example of the global Filipina body that circulates within Filipinex American cultural production, including the mail order bride, the Filipina sex worker slash trafficked woman, the balikbayan, and the cyborg. So I use this term balikbayan, which refers to Filipinex folks from the global north often the US, Canada, and Australia, who return to the Philippines <clears throat> and I use the term cyborg uh, to reference a science fictional figure for a queer diasporic future. That's the focus of chapter four. Each of these chapters, <clears throat> each of these figures embodies the gendered and sexual politics of representing the Philippine nation 
within the Philippinex diasporic imagination. So my analysis of these gendered figures of Philippinex transnationalism reveals the essential contradiction that is at the heart of this project. On the one hand, clearing the global Filipina body critiques the heteronormativity and the masculinism of diasporic nationalisms as they are reproduced within Filipinex American performance, film, video, and heritage language programs. On the other hand, in the context of the Filipinex diaspora, the Philippine nation continues to function as a sign of sovereignty and liberation from neo-imperialism and neoliberal globalization. So this image accompanied an article in GMA News Source, which is a Philippine news um, website. The familiarity of this image reflects the ubiquity of images of trafficked women within both US pop culture and Philippine X diasporic culture. This article written by Lila Ramos Shahani, an assistant secretary during the Aquino Philippine presidential administration was originally delivered as the keynote lecture at a conference held at the University of Washington, Seattle, titled Human Trafficking in an Era of Globalization, Forced Labor in Voluntary Servitude and Corporate and Civic Responsibility that was held in January of 2013. This image accompanied a poignant story of a young Filipina girl who was offered a high paying waitress job abroad who arrives in Malaysia to find out she has been deceived. Instead, she is held against her will and forced into sexual slavery, intended to invoke transnational affects of pity and indignation. The figure of the Filipina trafficked woman is pervasive within Filipinex diasporic political culture. However, the figure of the Filipina trafficked woman is often collapsed with the migrant sex worker. The traffic in women discourse as it circulates within contemporary Filipinex American cultural production makes very little distinction between migrant workers who do domestic work, migrant sex workers who choose to do sex work, and migrant Filipinas who are forced or coerced into labor. The traffic in women discourse often conflates distinct forms of gendered labor, such as the domestic labor performed by maids and nannies and the sexual labor of Filipina bar hostesses in Japan. The fraught politics of the heteropatriarchal nation, transnational labor, and global capitalism coalesce within the constellation of figures of racialized, gendered Philippine, Philippine X labor, the trafficked woman, the male order bride, the domestic helper, that constitute the global Filipina body. The figure of the global Filipina body circulates within the political economic context of outward transnational labor migration from the Philippines. And while there have been several studies of Philippine X migration and the gendered transnational labor market, there has been less scholarship on how the global Filipina body circulates as a figure within both global popular culture and Philippine X diasporic culture, especially from a cultural studies viewpoint. Sociologists Anna Guevara and Robin Rodriguez have described how the Philippine state brokers a contemporary global labor diaspora of more than 8 million Philippine X workers. Philippine literary and film studies scholars, Neferti Tadiar, Caroline Howe, and Roland Tolentino have argued that Filipina domestic workers, sex workers, and mail order brides serve as a sign of the Philippine nation as well as the commodification of gendered Philippine labor within the global economy. This project combines textual and visual analysis with ethnographic methods to examine both the representation of the global Filipina body 
within Philippinex American cultural production, as well as the social worlds in which these discourses circulate. Queering the global Filipina body presents an interdisciplinary transnational feminist cultural studies analysis of the disc discursive production of the global Filipina body. The identification of the Philippine nation with sex work, both by the international sex industry and nationalist movements in the Philippines, incites broader nationalist anxieties about transnational capital's threat to the sovereignty of the heteropatriarchal nation. In the diasporic context, the exploitation of the global Filipina body signifies both the failure of the heteropatriarchal nation under global capital and the racialization of an international division of labor. As Nefertiti Tadiar has argued, the figure of the Filipina sex worker signals the shift in the Philippine economy to export oriented industrialization and tourism, showing how, quote, prostituted women thus become the symptoms of the crisis of the nation, end quote. The figure of the Filipina sex worker slash trafficked woman exemplifies the subordination of the Philippine nation within an international division of labor highlighting the Philippine economy's reliance on remittances from Philippine ex workers abroad. The global Filipina body also signifies the failure of the heteropatriarchal family to retain a traditional gendered division of labor. So this is a rupture of conventional forms of gendered domesticity in which women provide domestic and sexual labor only for their husbands, not for clients outside the home. Here, the cohesiveness of the national body as a heteropatriarchal unit is threatened by the prostitution of feminized transnational labor migration. Philippine popular discourses echo this anxiety that Filipino women's migra migration abroad causes the breakdown of the nuclear family. Popular and scholarly narratives portray the challenges of transnational parenting and the plight of unemployed men whose wives are working abroad. Within both Philippine pop culture, as well as scholarship on transnational Filipinex labor, from the popular Philippine film Anak from the 1990s, to ethnographic research describing the effects of labor migration on the children left behind. The deterioration of the heteronormative nuclear family has been a highly visible discourse. Nationalist anxieties about the maintenance of the heteronormative family unit persist within Philippine pop culture precisely because transnational labor migration destabilizes the gendered and sexual politics of the nation. The figure of the global Filipina body also has the potential to queer the Philippine nation state. And by this, I mean that the figure of the global Filipina body and the transnational labor that she presents highlights the impotence of the heteropatriarchal Philippine state to provide for and protect its citizens and reveals the porosity that the diaspora introduces into the boundaries of the nation state. So here I use the term queer to refer to the way in which the diaspora and transnational labor more specifically requires a renegotiation of the gendered and sexual politics of the nation. The Filipino trafficked woman slash sex worker corporealizes the gendered and sexual anxieties of the Philippine nation as her body signifies the gendered subordination of the Philippines to an international division of labor. Thus transnational labor functions to queer the Philippine nation, not only because the diaspora has the potential to disrupt the politics of nationalism, but because transnational labor 
unsettles the very heteropatriarchy of the nation itself. The gendered and sexual labor, labor provided by the global Filipina body within the homes, bedrooms, and brothels of the global North cannot be contained within the heteronormative family of the nation. The queering of the global Filipina body also introduces a shift within the field of queer studies to an analysis of racialized transnational labor within queer cultural politics. The global Filipina body represents a double and multi-directional queering of both the heteropatriarchal nation as well as the field of queer studies. More specifically, this project presents a queer analysis of the politics of diasporic nationalisms within Filipinx American cultural production and heritage language programs. I examine how Filipinx American tropes of the Philippine nation can encompass a queer and feminist imagining of the Filipinx diaspora. The historical role of the Philippines within the U.S. imperial imagination and the influence of U.S. capital in shaping contemporary notions of Philippine national identity inform this book's focus on Philippinex American cultural production. So I use a queer diasporic approach to analyze the politics of nationalism in the Philippinex diaspora from a specifically feminist and queer perspective. In doing so, this project integrates a transnational feminist analysis of globalized gendered labor with a critique of mainstream LGBT politics in the US. Ultimately, queering the global Filipina body uses a queer diasporic analytical framework to ask, how can we envision forms of belonging beyond the familial model of the nation, even as we hold on to the liberatory potential of popular nationalist movements as vehicles of struggle against US neo-imperialism and capitalist globalization? So now I'm going to move on from an overview of the theoretical framework of the book to chapter three, which examines the figure of the Filipina mail order bride within the artwork of the Filipinex American Art Collective, the mail order brides or mob. Filipina American artists, Eliza Barrios, Jennifer Wolford and Rianne Estrada form the San Francisco Bay Area based performance and visual art ensemble, the Mail Order Brides, or MOB. Largely in response to the representation of fallen Filipina women, the Mail Order Brides use humor to contest the broader racialized and gendered discourse through which Filipina bodies are constituted and made visible under global capitalism. The Mail Order Brides create work in a variety of media, including installation art, photography, video art, karaoke videos, and performance. So in the, in the Mail Order Brides biography, they describe their collective work. And this is a quote from their artist statement. For over a decade, Eliza Nening Barrios, Rian Immaculata Estrada, and Jennifer Baby Wolford have worked collaboratively as mail order brides, a trio of Filipina American artists engaged in an ongoing collaborative investigation of culture, race, and gender. While traditionally real mail order brides are thought of as ideal obedient domestics, it has not escaped this trio's attention that Economically speaking, mail order brides abbreviates down to a more sinister series of initials that inform the darker subtext of their connivings and conspirings. They have taken matters into their own well-manicured hands using their innate graciousness 
good fashion sense and interior decorating slash decorum skills to gently pry open the eyes of the close-minded. They have pursued this vision through a cornucopia of creative endeavors, including photographic psychodramas, parade performances, public service posters, karaoke music videos, museum makeovers, and educational workshops. Their recent successful business venture, Always a Bridesmaid, Never a Bride, has provided the world with long needed services of three professional bridesmaids for weddings, commitment ceremonies, and immigration inspired marital arrangements, end quote. Calling attention to what they term the women in distress persona of Filipina women within popular culture, the male litter brides satirize hegemonic notions of Filipinx American femininity and ethnic identity. And while Mob references the trope of the Filipina bride specifically, their exploration of the politics of gendered, domestic, and affective labor resonates with scholarly and activist feminist debates on gendered transnational labor more broadly. Mob pokes fun at conventional artist statements, as well as notions of bourgeois femininity and the institution of marriage. Their brilliantly colored, exquisitely decorated vision of reality materializes in the jewel-toned images of hyperbolized femininity that the male litter brides present in their photography and videos. <clears throat> their emphasis on interior decorating slash inner decorum references the affective element of their work as they bring the interior forward into the public space. Mob suggests that exterior tropes of femininity, femininity such as well-manicured hands, innate graciousness, good fashion sense, are intrinsically linked to the interior elements of affective labor, such as nurturing and caregiving. In doing so, the male litter brides demonstrate how discourses of racialized and gendered labor under global capitalism rely on the performance of both interior and exterior tropes of affective labor. The male litter brides project, Always a Bridesmaid, Never a Bride, or ABNAB, includes performances, art installations, video infomercials, and glossy color brochures and postcards advertising their fictional bridesmaid services. This chapter focuses on a video testimonial, one of a series of four videos in All is a Bridesmaid, Never a Bride. This video series promotes the services of this Rent a Bridesmaid company. From 2005 to 2010, the video series screened in multiple community and academic venues, mainly in the San Francisco Bay Area, Los Angeles, and Manila, Philippines. Always a Bridesmaid, Never a Bride is structured as a faux infomercial featuring testimonials by satisfied clients of the mail order brides. The video features short vignettes of the group's past successful weddings, highlighting same-sex weddings and weddings for purposes of immigration. The video juxtaposes still images of the mail order brides in their various bridesmaids costumes with the video sequences, while voiceover testimonials from satisfied customers describe the various services that ABNAB offers. So I'm going to show you a short clip from the video. And please do let me know if you have issues with the sound.
stop there. The mail-order bride's use of the infomercial genre and the testimonial form in particular highlights the commodification of affective labor within the institution of marriage. Mob's parody of gay marriage as a business challenges the discursive production of the white gay consumer citizen as the subject of heteronormativity. In particular, Mob's satire of customer testimonials emphasizes the constitution of the white homo-nationalist subject as a citizen consumer of third world women's workers' labor. At the same time, Always a Bridesmaid, Never a Bride's satire of marriage challenges the moralistic and masculinist notions of Filipina femininity that bolster popular representations of Filipina male or brides within Filipinx American cultural production. The male or brides contest the politics of heteropatriarchal respectability within Filipinx American representations of the Filipina male or bride while critiquing gay marriage as a form of homonormativity. In their satire of the male or bride industry or the marriage industry, Mob plays with the representation of Filipina women as innately hospitable and domestic, a discourse that positions Filipina women as naturalized sources of gendered labor. So the male or bride staging of Always a Bridesmaid, Never a Bride occurred in San Francisco, California, immediately after the mayor at the time Gavin Newsom declared gay marriage legal. As a hub for queer culture and a destination for queer tourism, as well as the home of well-established Asian American and recent Asian migrant communities, San Francisco is a global city in which neoliberal citizenship, racialized migrant labor, and queer cultural politics coalesce. So now I will show you another video from the ABNAB series. Just one second. Just one second. I think that was the same one we showed previously. Sorry, one second. Here we go. Most about the always team is that they're always there with such true integrity and commitment to the cause and they're there with the utmost professionalism forsaking themselves and only thinking about the bride and how she can be the princess she's always wanted to be. I remember that day like it was yesterday. The announcement came while my honey and I were working out at the gym and it was like a bolt out of the blue. They were marrying gays at City Hall, but we didn't know how long it was gonna last. So we rushed down there and we realized we didn't have any witnesses. We, we didn't have any wedding party. Thank goodness for always a bridesmaid, never a bride. They sure did come through for us. Boy, that teary-eyed hysteria, it was perfect. I tell you, it made our wedding photos and their confetti cleanup. They put the maid and bridesmaid, I mean, those girls must come from a long line of domestic workers, and I just can't give them a higher endorsement. If you need wedding party help, they're the ones. Always a bridesmaid, never a bride. I remember when we first heard our calling, 
It was Del and Phyllis's ceremony. There was a violent fringe element that threatened to disrupt the happy occasion. It seemed only natural to step in and be supportive of the happy couple. Little did we know it would become our successful business. Always a bridesmaid, never a bride. Every couple is special. Every couple needs a different kind of support. I remember this one couple. All they needed was three great gals to be there on their special day. La verdad es que no tuvimos mucho tiempo antes de la entrevista con el INS, pero han estado tan convincentes que casi yo misma me lo creo. I wanted to help people, to see them happy. I mean, there are other wedding vendors and such, but very few really have that level of commitment that we professional bridesmaids offer with our WMDs. My cousin Frankus, he came to town for the wedding not knowing no one. Well, he's, he's real awkward with the ladies and such. And the Nang, she made him feel right at home. We feel that we're at the front lines of this battle to make marriage more merry. Integrity and preparedness is our motto. As a professional bridesmaid, you have to be ready for anything. We always say, we go the extra mile down the aisle. So the dialogue and the images that you all just saw in this faux infomercial <clears throat> articulate a capitalist logic that renders Filipina bodies as the naturalized embodiment of domestic labor for a neoliberal global economy. As one of their clients testifies of ABNAB's services, they put the maid into bridesmaid. In particular, this dialogue foregrounds the gay citizen consumer as the beneficiary of gendered and racialized labor. In the video, mobs vacant facial expressions and identical pink dresses with elaborate lacy white collars emphasize the doll-like effect of their countenance. The stark contrast of their white makeup with their brown skin makes evidence the performance of race essential to the figuring of Filipina bodies as naturalized sources of domestic, affective, and sexual labor. The mail order brides implicitly critique the logic of exchangeability. This is visualized through their identical pink outfits that characterizes third world women as replaceable 
sources of devalued labor. Mob's satirical description of their vocational calling as pro professional bridesmaids exemplifies the discursive construction of Filipinx workers as caring and warm, which serves to naturalize the affective and domestic labor that they provide. Mob uses the humorous method of feminist camp to emphasize the historical and contemporary discourses that position Filipina male litter brides as sources of sexual labor. The male litter brides invocation of the Filipina sex worker made up in whiteface calls to mind the figure of the geisha. Within the Western popular imagination, the figure of the geisha is the penultimate orientalized embodiment of affective and sexual labor. Her role is not solely to satiate the sexual desires of heterosexual men, but to make them feel comfortable and sexually attractive. The orientalist representation of the geisha slash sex worker slash bridesmaid within always a bridesmaid, never a bride, makes evident the necessity of ethnic drag, a specifically ethnic and racialized performance of gendered affective and sexual labor intrinsic to the work that Filipina women do for a global economy. Mob's invocation of the figure of the geisha also reflects the history and ongoing present of Filipinas as sources of sexual labor for a global economy from the forced servitude of Filipina comfort women during World War II to the rest and recreation of US servicemen at US military bases in the Philippines to the global sex trade, suggesting that contemporary forms of Filipinx labor are always already imbricated in multiple histories of colonialism and neo-colonialism. So here you see the male litter brides wearing barong shirts, which are traditionally worn by Filipino men for formal occasions. They're also wearing dresses with the puffy sleeves. Those are called um, terno dresses, which are another form of ethnic dress that signifies Philippine nationality. Through its parody of the commodification of affective labor in the service of same-sex marriage, Always a Bridesmaid, Never a Bride presents an implicit critique of queer neoliberalism. The emphasis on the ritual of marriage as a means of inclusion into the broader consumer citizenship of the US exemplifies the logic of homonormativity. So here you see an example of this form of consumer citizenship, a target ad targeting gay couples um, to create a wedding registry. The male litter bride's parody of the consumer nature of gay inclusion into the national family is also an implicit critique of the racialization of this process. A particularly striking image is one of a white newly married lesbian couple embracing on the steps of City Hall, wrapped in a gigantic American flag. The image visualizes the affective connection between the institution of marriage and US nationalism. Here ideologies of US national belonging are intertwined with the ideology of marriage equality, reifying the imbrication of whiteness with marriage and belonging to the US nation. The implicit visual narrative of this image connects notions of US liberal democracy and freedom to the rights-based claim of marriage equality, suggesting that the US and San Francisco in particular is a site of freedom for queers. Despite the celebratory discourse surrounding the US Supreme Court's 2015 ruling of the Defense of Marriage Act as unconstitutional, the benefits granted to same-sex married couples are largely limited to documented middle-class 
property owning monogamous couples. The Mail Order Brides link their critique of gay marriage as a form of inclusion into the nation state with the broader politics of racialized migration through their depiction of marriages for the purpose of citizenship. Interspersed with images and video sequences of gay weddings are scenes of INS interventions. So the Immigration and, nat and Naturalization Service, which is now called um, the Department of Homeland Security, in which the mail order rides prevent INS agents from disrupting the weddings of binational couples. In one image, the mail order brides pose triumphantly over the figures of fallen INS agents, clad in dark suits and earpieces who failed in their attempt to disrupt the wedding ceremony of a heterosexual binational couple. As a result of the mail order brides successful intervention, the happy couple is able to go through with their marriage assuring citizenship for the Filipina bride. Through the juxtaposition of binational weddings with gay marriage, Always a Bridesmaid, Never a Bride introduces a critique of racialized migration and labor into the affective politics of gay marriage. The Mail Order Brides enactment of feminist camp within a context of racialized and gendered transnational Filipinx labor migration highlights the invisibility of third world women workers labor as a genre that has historically been associated with white gay male culture camp has been critiqued for its blatantly misogynistic images of female excess. In contrast, the Mail Order Brides enact a form of feminist camp to critique the discursive embodiment of Filipino workers as sources of affective labor. Building on theorists Pamela Robertson's and Jose Munoz's discussions of feminist and queer of color interventions in camp as a performance strategy, I argue that the Mail Order Brides use of feminist camp calls attention to the performance of ethnic or ethnicized gender and gendered ethnicity required of Filipinas as providers of affective labor. The Mail Order Brides enactment of feminist camp critiques both the racialized homonationalism of mainstream US LGBT politics and the position of third world women workers within a broader international division of labor. The mail order brides suggest that racialized and gendered labor is itself a form of ethnic drag. Their performance of gendered Philippine, Philippinex ethnicity is visually signified by their wearing of Philippine nationalist dress and their use of whiteface. Mob's performance of corporeal and sartorial markers of ethnic and racial difference exposes the nature of affective labor within capitalist globalization, which requires ethnic and racialized subjects to perform banal forms of ethnic and racial difference. The Mail Order Bride's performative embodiment as eternal bridesmaids visualizes the forms of corporeal and affective labor, cleaning up after the wedding party, kneeling to roll out the aisle for their trademarked aisle service, shedding tears during the ceremony that position the global Filipina body as essentially outside of both hetero and homo nationalist subjectivity. While the domestic and affective labor of the global Filipina body is necessary for the constitution of the white, middle class, hetero, and homo nationalist subject, mail order brides, the mail order brides are never able to access this form of national respectability themselves. As their title suggests, the global Filipina body is always a bridesmaid, never a bride. 
as figures whose corporeal labor is rendered outside of the norm of bourgeois respectability and marriage, their bodies are instead circumscribed by global capitalist discourses that figure transnational Filipina bodies as sex workers, trafficked women, gold diggers, or maids. In Pamela Robertson's words, the male at her bride plays at what she is already perceived to be. <clears throat> so I will end here um, to make sure I don't go too much over time. Um, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts, questions, comments, um, and suggestions for future directions. Thank you so much for that. <clears throat> um, if you want to take a moment and maybe get a sip of water, um, we can ask our audience to please um, put any questions or comments they might have in the Q&A box. Um, <clears throat> and we can sort of get the, the conversation going. Okay. Well, while we're waiting for other people to, to put their questions in the box, I was wondering if I could start with one of my own. Um, Dr. Velasco. Yeah, so your presentation was so fascinating. Thank you so much for this work that you're doing. And um, in my own work, I look at um, migration and gender and, and how people perform gender. And so I'm just wondering, um, could you tell me a little bit about, tell us a little bit about the, the methods you used or like maybe the process of how like did you um, begin to contextualize like this work, the work that ultimately led to this book? Was there a particular like literature or, you know, mm -hmm. something of your own interest? I just love to hear the journeys of scholars of um, how they kind of got, got to this place in, in the book, because it's so helpful for all of us graduate students to really mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. think about that. I'd be happy to. Um, so this book originally came out of my dissertation research, although uh, it greatly transformed since I finished my PhD. And I went to an interdisciplinary program called the History of Consciousness at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and that program is somewhat unique in that um, we are encouraged to first think about a set of theoretical questions and not necessarily uh, to develop our research projects um, through a particular methodology. And I will say that my undergraduate degree was actually in cultural anthropology. Um, and I had thought that I would do more of an ethnographic project originally. Um, but I came to Hiscon to work with Nefertiti Tadiar, who is a literature and film studies scholar. And I also lived in the Bay Area at the time, which, as folks may or may not know, has a rich Filipinx American culture, including um, an, a performing and artistic um, and visual arts culture. At the time, there was a Filipinx American theater called Bindlestiff, so I would go to performances there, um, go to film festivals, such as the Asian American Film Festival. And I realized slowly that my archive would not um, be solely an ethnographic one, right? That I was interested as at look interested in looking at these performance and video texts as part of a kind of broader um, discussion and perhaps contestation about what it meant to think of yourself as part of a diaspora. Um, at the same time in graduate school, I was being trained in feminist theory, being trained in um, queer studies, and these are both fields that historically, especially in the global north, have been very critical to nationalism, right? And for very good reason, 
there are many very good critiques that one could make. Um, but I was also seeing a lot of on the ground activism that was done in the name of Philippine national liberation among West Coast Philippinex American communities. And I really wanted to think through how are we working out these tensions within the forms of culture that we are creating? And how are we um, representing what it means to be part of a diaspora through these transnational figures. So that's eventually what became this idea of a set of figures called the global Filipina body. Thank you so much. That's so helpful and really fascinating. Um, your history and anthropology too, so cool. Thank you. I will um, say that the sole ethnographic chapter is um, based on several months that I spent at a heritage language program that used to be affiliated with the University of California system. So it was almost entirely um, Filipinx American undergrads in the UC system who were studying abroad in the Philippines. And so they were taught Philippine history, Filip Filipino language, um, and a lot of them were coming from communities in which Filipinx American cultural nationalism is very prominent. Um, I came from a different context. I'm from Dallas, Texas. So all of this was very new and curious to me. Um, and so I actually, I did one of those programs, a, a different program, um, but also one where I studied Tagalog when I was in graduate school. So I decided that I wanted to spend some time with students studying abroad as part of what became the book. Um, well, I have a question <clears throat> kind of to follow up on that. You mentioned the ways in which um, these narratives of the, the, the Filipina body, the, the geo body, sort of appear in um, a lot of, I guess, transnational or diasporic texts, um, like the film and the, and, the, and the academic book. I'm interested to see, do, are there ways in which they show up in those programs, those, the heritage mm -hmm. language learner mm -hmm. programs and, 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 and in what ways sort mm -hmm. of like, do they, and are they critiqued or how do they show mm -hmm. up? Um, I would say, and this is something I talk about in, in the chapter based on interviews with students and teachers in one of these programs, that they often come up sideways, right? So it's often this fear that kind of haunts this diasporic imagination. So whether it is um, especially heterosexual male Balikbayans who are young Filipinx Americans returning to the Philippines, whether it's their kind of anger about seeing young Filipina women with older white American men, um, or it in one of the examples I give in the book, um, so the students would hang out at the kind of local places that college students at the University of the Philippines would hang out. And um, I was friends with several of the students and one of them um, who is a self-described feminist came up to me and said that she was really angry because she had just witnessed one of her classmates in the program um, performing this spoken word poem about how uh, part of coming home to the Philippines was kind of reclaiming the figure of the global Filipina body, right? So kind of um, exerting a kind of possessiveness around this figure as a part of what it meant to kind of claim one's ethnic and national identity. Um, they would all students, I would hear students make comments um, about 
Jose Rizal, who is a Philippine national hero, and the fact that he had a white American girlfriend as an example of why to sort of invalidate him as a national hero, because there's actually a long standing debate over whether he should be a national hero. So I would, I actually argue in that chapter that it is um, the global Filipina body is this is this somewhat, there's a sort of absent presence of her figure within the ways in which Philams express their belonging to the Philippine nation. And it also comes out, you know, around all of the um, kind of indignation that Filipina women would be mail order brides. So I also look at Philam websites where people are very upset. They think it's morally wrong that women in the Philippines would choose to marry men who are three times their age in order to come to the US. So there, it is very much linked into the kind of politics of respectability and the heteropatriarchy of cultural nationalism in the US too, right? And so I'm sure folks can, can sort of make parallels to other forms of cultural nationalism among communities of color in the US. Thank you. Yeah, this is, I love this. Um, we did get a question from, um, from Liam Gleason in the chat and they wanted to ask you, how has your own identity and experiences um, and research with queer theory impacted how you teach classes, specifically in the US? Sure. Um, well, I teach a course called Queer Globalization. And one of the questions that we ask in this class is how do or do notions of queer genders and sexualities, or even the term queer, does it travel across national borders? And we, you know, the answer is sometimes, but not always. And so I think that I always am very aware of my own positionality as a queer Filipinx American scholar who is, you know, trained in the US, born and raised in the US and teaching in the US um, to the limits of what that positionality, um, what those, what the limits are. And let me give you an example. So currently there is somewhat of a fierce debate between Philams or Philippinex Americans and Filipinos in the Philippines about the term Filipinex. And similarly to the term Latinx, it's a term taken up, you know, it started actually by Philam youth in social media, but it's a term taken up as one that is more gender inclusive. Um, but it is quite contested by folks in the Philippines because they, would actually say that it is an imposition by Philams, that Philams, you know, know nothing about the Philippines. Um, there are arguments that the dominant Philippine language, Filipino, which is basically Tagalog, is already gender neutral, which is not true, although there is a gender neutral pronoun. So the idea being that we cannot assume if we're working in a transnational context that ideas around queer identity or trans identity are universal, like even in one's own ethnic community. And, and there have been similar debates around the term Latinx. And it, it also points to the fact that the, the term Filipinex emerges out of, out of a specifically U.S. racial formation, right? Taking inspiration from and with the aim of building solidarity with 
Latinx communities and other communities of color in the U.S. Whereas, you know, folks in the Philippines are dealing with a very different racial formation. That's really helpful. And I didn't, I didn't personally know that, uh, that Tagalog, so is there no like feminine and masculine verbs in, in Tagalog or Cebuano? The verbs are not um, gendered, but the pronoun like sha um, or sia is a gender neutral pronoun in place of he or she. That said, um, I, I, I actually think that that is, um, you know, not really a strong um, basis for making the argument that, um, that Philippine culture is already gender inclusive. I mean, especially given, you know, the history of Spanish colonialism and Catholicism. Thank you. That's really, I just, I love learning language terms and, and things like that. So that's really helpful. And thank you, Gleason, for the question. And I appreciate the talks about positionality because we're so important for us to, to have that framework in our work and how we talk about it. So hearing you talk about it is so helpful. So thank you so much. As we wait for more questions, I did have a question. So you mentioned that the sort of installations and, and sort of the different art, artistic productions of the um, MLB um, were um, <clears throat> performed, exhibited um, throughout the, the Bay Area, but also in Manila. And mm -hmm. I'm interested um, to hear about what Sort of the reception was what what were the discourses that sort of came out of that if you if you're familiar if, you know if you mm -hmm. can speak to that a little bit you know i actually don't know what the reception was in the philippines um i know that um the artists especially one of the artists jennifer wofford has done um shows they're they're all visual artists as well and work in other uh, media I know that Jennifer Wolford has done shows in Manila, um, but I'm not quite sure. Um, I think that the, the pieces have primarily circulated in Asian American and queer artistic and academic spaces. So I've seen some of their work in actual museum spaces. Um, a lot of what they do are funny little videos or photo series. Um, so sometimes there are like physical objects to engage with, but some, some of their work is primarily um, circulated as video. Yeah. <clears throat> I was curious because it seemed um, very uh, much within the context of the US, like a lot of the critiques that mm -hmm. at least were visible to me um, were mm -hmm. reflective of uh, sort of the Filipina mm -hmm. <clears throat> of within the US context, right? Like the racialized sort of the US gay marriage equality, the INS, like it was, and mm -hmm. so, um, reading how that translates within the context of Manila um, would be interesting. I think. <clears throat> okay. Um, do we have any more questions? If not, we will need to keep uh, Dr. Velasco waiting. Brittany, did you have any more? Um, I guess the only thing if I could ask really quick is like, mm -hmm. um, your future directions, like mm -hmm. you see yourself mm -hmm. continuing on, there's so much to mm -hmm. document or so many things you, you could do, you, you know, expanding on this. I would just love to know what visions or mm -hmm. dreams you have moving forward in your work. I actually realized um, after finishing my monograph that I wanted to be in, I wanted to be in conversation and writing a monograph is a very kind of solitary experience. Um, 
And so I decided I actually want to do an edited collection of queer Filipinx studies, which has not been done. Um, while several of the kind of foundational scholars in the field of Filipinx American studies also do queer studies, there's also kind of a new cohort of um, more recent scholars whose work I think is really fascinating. A lot of it does use this debate around Filipinx as a way to theorize a specifically Filipinx American um, queer theoretical framework. Um, so I'm interested in, I'm, I, or I have plans to co-edit um, a collection and I'm in conversation with a few presses right now. And um, one of my co-editors is Dr. Karen Hanna at Connecticut College. So that's our hope. We are talking to a few presses and thinking about what directions um, we'll take the book in. Thank you, I love that. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> and thank you for our um, attendees, participants for, for coming and engaging with the talk. Um, we are so glad to have you, Dr. Valesco. Um, we, um, I look forward to reading more of your work as well. Um, <clears throat> for our audience, as I mentioned earlier, we will have several more talks in the spring, so keep your eye out for that. Um, and thank you so much again, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much for having me. It really has been a pleasure. And I wanna say, um, especially to graduate students, I would be happy to um, engage with your ideas, feedback, thoughts, if you would like to email me, it's very easy to find me online. <laughs>